as we come together, I rejoice that I have this opportunity looking back that, wow, this is the last day of the year. Tomorrow starts a brand new year, new beginnings. We have new beginnings in Jesus Christ. And it is good to have mentally try to do a reset and set a goal for a new year. But more important than setting a goal is having a priority where, um, let's look to Jesus, where we say, um, Master, as a lawyer did, trying to trick up the Lord Jesus, in Matthew, we have the record in Matthew 22, 36 to 40. Master, which is the greatest commandment of the law? The intention and purpose was to start a debate to get a row going. But the Lord Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two laws hang all the law and the prophets. And we only have to think for a minute. Love God, love your neighbor. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath, loving God. Thou shalt not steal, loving my neighbor. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, loving God. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. You shouldn't lie. Love your neighbor. So on just those two, all those commandments, all those laws hang. And the lawyer, I don't have an angle. I don't have a comeback with him. And so the master spelled out the priority. Loving God, loving our neighbor. And so with that as a kind of a backdrop, I want to look at um, a way that an Old Testament saint loved God. How did he love God? A scribe, a man who copies things from one thing to another. He would do this in handwriting before they had copy machines and such. And so this man was called a scribe. His name is Ezra. And as you look into your bulletin insert, it's titled, Ezra the scribe and kings Amaziah and Hezekiah. We have the record in scripture inspired by God of Ezra. Ezra was a captive in Babylonia and the scripture records this Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. And the king granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. This is not used often in Scripture, but what a description of this man of God. The Scripture records the hand of the Lord his God was on him. Why? Why was the hand of the Lord upon Ezra? And I want to even give it a little more context. Babylon was in southern Iraq. Think about that in today's terms. What if a Jew was in Iraq and the king gave the Jew whatever he requested? Think of that right now. The whole Muslim world is like the nation of Israel is attacking our Muslim brothers in Gaza. Everybody's mad. But in this context, in this day in the past, here was Ezra. Whatever the king wanted, he requested. So he said, I want to go back to my homeland. I want to go back to my homeland. And the king granted him all that he asked. So scripture records going on to verse 7. And there went up also to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king, some of the people of Israel, and some of the priests and Levites and singers and gatekeepers and the temple servants. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem again. For the good hand of his God was on him. So now after 
general statement, good hand was upon him. Now after four months of trekking through wilderness, dangerous places, we, they could have been robbed, killed. We have this record in Scripture. The good hand was upon him and he made it back to Jerusalem. But here's a question. Why was the good hand of the Lord upon Ezra? Very important question. How could he, in the foreign land as a captive, as a minority, have God's hand upon him where the king granted him his request? Verse 10, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. You say that again, some other translations, the good hand of the Lord was upon him because Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord. So think about these four things. It was a decision. He decided, he set his heart to study God's word. Okay? Set his heart. He studied it. That's intellectual. The Lord Jesus said you should love the Lord your God with all your mind. So Ezra with his mind was loving the Lord God by studying his word. But also it says to do it. So here's an issue of the will. He didn't just read it for intellectual knowledge and there are people that know the Bible as an intellectual exercise. He was obeying it. He was living it out so that it was more than just academic exercise. And even to the point where it bubbled up in him, I can't keep this to myself. He taught it. He taught the Word of God. He let other people know, this is what God's Word says you're supposed to do, and me too. This is what we need to obey. So it had that effect on his life. I want to contrast Ezra, this scribe, with people that were higher up than him, if you will, in the Jewish culture, two former kings. Two former kings that Ezra would have written about as he copied an old section of Scripture that's falling apart and copied it on a fresh scroll, copying away. The first of them is King Amaziah. What does the record of the Word of God have for us to say about Amaziah? In 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 1, we see Amaziah was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not with a whole heart. So here we have a record for all time about Amaziah's reign. Amaziah's 29 years that he was a king over Israel. And what is the record of it? He did what was, what was right in the eyes of God. But you know, there's people that do what's right not out of a heart, out of duty. It's Sunday, we go to church, and it's ritual. It's not a heart decision. It's not because they love God. They go because it's the right thing to do. I mean, moral people are good. I'd want them as my neighbors. Moral people that say, thou shalt not steal. We have taught our kids, you don't steal. And so that's a good neighbor to me. But not with his whole heart. And that's the record that this king of Israel has, Amaziah. Strong contrast to that. What about the king below, King Hezekiah? What does the word of God record? Is it after three chapters of telling about Hezekiah, it ends with these two verses. Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. And every work that he undertook in the service of the house of God and in accordance with the law and the commandments, seeking his God he did with all his heart and prospered. Three things there. Hezekiah sought God, bottom line. 
He did it with all his heart. And what happened in his situation? He prospered. In Amaziah's case, the kingdom had problems. And think about this then. Ezra's writing these things down. It has an effect on his life. There is no longer a king in Israel. So here he is copying the scriptures years later. He's copying the accounts of Amaziah, Hezekiah, and other kings as well, but I just picked these two. And we have this contrast of the heart. One not with his whole heart and one with his whole heart. And we have then the record Ezra studied the law, set his heart. He made a choice and he was going to wholeheartedly study the law. And as we get to a new year, I wanted to challenge you. Will you study more diligently the Word of God? Will you try to have a more wholehearted approach to that? Let's turn the page now and look at one more. The Lord Jesus Himself, as Pastor Mark read the Scripture. The Scripture, we commonly use the English Standard Version, and it says, When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, He set His face to go to Jerusalem. And that's probably the more correct or accurate right down to the Greek. Set his face. But we don't use that term. I like the newer translation down below. As the time drew near for him to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. What does resolute mean? Merriman Webster tells us, marked by firm determination, resolved, bold, steady. The Lord Jesus, I'm going to Jerusalem. And that was a change in the Gospel of Luke. From then on, he was heading to Jerusalem. That chapter was the first time he told the disciples, I'm going to die and rise again. And that, I'm sure, just shocked them. It's like, James, what do you think? He says, I don't know, John, but that die and rise again i is the master going crazy weird they never heard that but jesus started a whole new perspective in chapter 9 of luke he resolutely set his face to jerusalem and that's where he was going now he stopped along the way to talk to a man named zacchaeus he stopped along the way and told uh, parables to people that we have through chapters of Luke, but that was the turning point in Luke's Gospel. That was the turning point, but what about the ending point when they arrived at Jerusalem? I want to challenge our thinking about the Lord Jesus being resolute, bold, marked by determination. At the end of his time in Jerusalem, he is with the disciples in the upper room. They're in a, hopefully, I'm sure it was a pretty secure place for them to have this quiet last meal together. So then he says, uh, I'm sorry, Luke records this at the end of the supper. He came out, this is Luke chapter 22, verses 39 and 40. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Let me back up. As was his custom is the record in Luke. So Luke is giving us a record of what Jesus did. You realize that the betrayer, Judas, was the only one that knew what in the dark, you can't find things in the country at night. So they needed someone to guide them to where Jesus would pray at night. Well, Jesus, knowing they're coming to get him, he still went, as Luke says, as was his custom. So he goes to the garden where he will pray, where he will be captured, bound up, and taken away, tried, and crucified. 
But is that resolute? Even knowing that this is, I'm leaving a place of safety, they went. Let me read John's Gospel, the very last verse of chapter 14. As he's talking to the disciples in the upper room, to the eleven now, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. So he says those words. I haven't finished the verse. I'll read it again. But I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. You know what that meant. Again, he's leaving a place of safety. Rise, go from here. We're going to the garden. I'm going to be captured, beat up, tortured, die. But was he resolute? Did he carry on? Yes, he did. He said, rise, let us go from here. I do what the Father has commanded, commanded me because I love the Father. And so, I give you these pictures, if you will, to challenge you as tomorrow starts a new year. I give you these pictures <coughs> Are you, am I, resolute? Because Jesus said in the garden before they captured Him, I have glorified you on earth having accomplished the work you gave me to do. And I'd like, you know, as I work at a adult foster care and now see people die since I started there in February, it's been like six or seven I hope that I could someday, as Jesus said, I've accomplished the work you gave me to do. Because I think of those people, death becomes real when you see it happening before your eyes. I hope I accomplished the work the Master has given me to do. And I hope you do too. But I want to just get real practical with you now. Um... How do we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? How do we determine that or put that into action? I want to love God more this year. Well, some practical ways then, because we want to be like Ezra and set our hearts on studying the law to do it. In the back, one way we can do that to know the Word of God better is to have a Bible reading plan. So at the back of the church, on our TV trays all across the back row, are Bible reading plans. Read the Bible through in a year. Read just the New Testament through in a year. Read five different sections of the Bible each day for a year to get through it. So you could read poetry, Old Testament, um, from the Gospels, from the letters, and something else. So there's, other, there's all these reading plans. There's one reading plan, read the Bible through in three years. Old Testament once, New Testament twice, scattered readings, or linear readings actually, I should say, but taking more time to read through the Bible because we need to know the Word of God. And so I want to challenge you to consider that. Prayer. To help you pray, there is a daily affirmation of faith that you could start to pray that tells us on a sheet, this is what Christ has done. You were dead in trespasses and sin. God's made you alive. God declared you condemned. Now that you've believed on Him, you are considered righteous. You were not. You were an enemy of God. Now you're called a son of God. And being an enemy... You didn't have any claim on anything, but as a son, you are now an heir. And there are things in there then, a daily affirmation of faith, God, you'll help me through the things I'm going through. That's in the back. Another thing, practical thing to help us love God more, is um, a page on the death and resurrection of Christ, scriptures, and on the other side of scriptures, He's coming again. When I was an in inter church intern for a year, 
The pastor challenged us, boys, every day I read a scripture and try to think about some aspect of the death of Christ. And every day, boys, I read some aspect of his return or resurrection. So there's a sheet of paper back there. One side, death and resurrection of Christ. Other side, coming again. So that can be an aid to you in your prayer life, thinking about Jesus and that kind of thing. This coming year, Bible study classes, could you be challenged then to be involved in a Bible study class? Seniors meet in the back room Wednesday mornings, and it's a joy for me to see that this is not just our church seniors, but there's people from other neighborhoods, there's relatives that come, and so God has a uh, a wonderful work there in having more seniors come to that Bible study. Um, ladies, early evening on Monday, Tuesday morning, my wife has a Bible study in the back classroom. Tuesday evening, there is a Bible study out at the Wellness Center on Grand River for ladies, an in-depth Bible study. There are various men's uh, Bible classes out at the Wellness Center or Bible studies. Teens meet Sunday evening, and Sunday evening we have the video in the back classroom. So those are ways, again, to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord, to love Him more, to more small group fellowships, like the one that's meeting right after church, a group of people that live, uh, that banded together to eat a meal, to think on things, to pray, maybe look at a scripture. Um, there are several groups meeting. And a last one. I want to grow in Christ-likeness. And so, on the inside of this bulletin insert, ten questions for you to start at the start of a new year. What I've been thinking about is number four. In which spiritual discipline do you most want to make progress this year? And what will you do about it? That's up for you to decide how, what you do, but I've given you some ideas, I've given you some options, I'm giving you some ways perhaps that God would provoke your heart. I need to do this or do that. So there's other questions to provoke your thinking. But the last one, just going to the back again of, of our time together here, accountability. Accountability. We are too much... John Wayne, I can conquer the West, I'm going to do it on my own. You know, and, but that's not us as the Church of Jesus Christ. We have the one another's. We are a body together. And accountability is a way for us to even further get that uh, one another togetherness. Accountability, you know, we know it's effective in this world. You look at Weight Watchers, they have accountability every week where you've got to jump on the scale. So I'm sure that helps some people. Well, I'd like that second slice of pie, but I'm going to get weighed tomorrow. I better put that aside. There's accountability there. There's accountability, and it's a, a good thing in Alcoholics Anonymous when someone, a recovering alcoholic starting out, they have them pair up with someone that they call the sponsor. I guess it's more of a mentor idea. Because here's this, say, a younger alcoholic, and he, what do I do? You know, he gets together with Jerry, let's say. Jerry, what do I do? These guys are saying, go, go out after work for a beer. What, what do I tell him? He says, look, you have to tell him this and this. You have to say those things. And he says, I'm going to call you tomorrow night in the evening to see if you did that or to see if you went with the boys after work to the bar. I'm going to be checking on you. And so because there is that accountability, if you will, that helps Jerry to stay in line as he's 
taking these faltering steps to push away from alcohol. And so accountability, I think, is a good thing if we can build into relationships of each other that way. And especially, I think, for men, as we um, have the temptation of pornography, the mission that I was with required all the men to have an accountability software on our computers. And since I've left, we, since Edie and I have retired, I still have that accountability software on my computer. And so, as a challenge to us all, do we want to grow in grace and godliness? Do we want to love the Lord our God with all our hearts? Then these are some ways, these are some challenges I have for you. I have a word of encouragement to close with. Paul writes a letter to encourage the Philippian believers and it's neat, he's away. He says, Dear friends, you, all, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. Now that I'm away, it's even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For Philippians, God is working in you, giving you the desire and power to do what pleases him. Praise God we're not on this on our own. We have the living and true God for the believer in Jesus Christ, the indwelling Holy Spirit to help us have the desire and power to do what pleases Him. Because the Lord Jesus said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so that is my challenge to you today, church. What are you going to do this coming year? And hopefully these questions on the inside and the scripture on the outside will help you to make those decisions for this coming year. Thank you.